Welcome back to another episode of Podcast on the Brink. Big game this week for Indiana. The Hoosiers will be in Cincinnati Friday night to take on Xavier in the Gavit tip-off games. And to help us preview this matchup, talk some early observations of Indiana and the Big Ten at large. One of my favorite college basketball writers, analysts, tweeters, whatever you want to call them, Rocco Miller, is here from the Bracketeer.org. Rocco, it was good to have you on the show last season, and we're happy to have have you on again uh, this year. Welcome back to the show. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be on. I appreciate you having me back. I really enjoyed uh, our conversation a year ago, and I know a lot has happened uh, since that point in time. Indiana made it back to the NCAA tournament, um, so uh, hopefully it was good luck last year, and and uh, the Hoosiers can go even further this year, as, as many hope and expect them to do. Um, but yeah, looking forward to the matchup. I think the, the season really begins for both Indiana and Xavier, uh, coming up on Friday. So excited to talk about that. So, yeah, you mentioned, Rocco, that last year when we talked, it was under different circumstances. There was a lot of uncertainty as to whether Indiana would make even make the tournament. This year, obviously, there's a different feeling uh, around this Indiana team, some really lofty preseason expectations. I'm just curious, from your perspective, somebody that you know is in the bracketology world, and I know, you know one of the things I, I love about you is you try to soak up as much college basketball as possible, no matter the level, whether it's low major, mid major, high major. So you know a little bit about every team, uh, which I, I don't have the luxury of doing because I'm so hyper focused on Indiana. I'm just curious, though, from your perspective, how surprised are you that Indiana finds itself in this position in year two of the Mike Woodson era? No, I'm somewhat surprised. I, I mean, obviously. Trace Jackson Davis is a game changer, difference maker. He's been an elite player in the sport going on three years now, um, or if not longer. So um, he, when you bring him and, and the majority of the core, pretty much the whole core back, and you add a couple big-time freshmen, uh, you know, like Jalen and Renault into the fold, uh, it, uh, it it gets people very excited. Indiana's always going to be a, one of the most popular teams uh, for historical and for current sport reasons. And I think that can add to some to some major media hype. And I think we saw a lot of that over the offseason. Uh, but the, the overall take I have uh, going in is I, I do think with with all the talent and all the experience, uh, the ceiling is very high. So I don't disagree with with some of those prognostications. Um, I would not be shocked if Indiana wins the league, for example, or lands in the top 10 uh, by the end of the year. Uh, so I so I think. You know, if, if you're in the Indiana locker room, uh, those are reasonable and achievable goals to have. Uh, but as a as a forecaster and just as kind of looking at what everybody's bringing to the table um, and just going off the fact that Indiana, um, you know, had a lot of the same guys last year and barely got in. Um, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to go that far from a preseason point of view. Uh, so I think I kind of hedged it between, you know, that some of those top 10 projections and and where they finished last year. And I, I opened the year with Indiana, you know, as a projected six seed, uh, I think 24th in the country, which I know might disappoint some people here in that because I'll admit they're capable of, of higher than that. But I think, um, you know, it's, it's more one of those prove it to me uh, situations. If, if Indiana had like a, this roster with a Tom Izzo or a coach that had been there 20 years, like a Jay Wright, um, it'd be a lot easier for me to put him higher. Uh, but Woodson's still in his second year uh, going through the wars. Um, you know, he had his ups and downs last year uh, going through the wars. If you go back and look at the road record, and that's really what moves the needle in the sport, if you can get wins on the road and obviously get that that first opportunity on Friday. Um, they went three and six uh, in, the I think, the Big Ten road games last year, maybe three and seven. I know it was three wins, but in the three wins, none of those teams – uh, we're tournament teams. So I think to take the program to the next level, you got to beat some teams on the road that are going to be part of the NCAA tournament. Um, again, they'll, they'll be able to start proving that on Friday. We'll see how that plays out. Um, but that's where I landed for, for Indiana specifically for the rest of the big 10. It's a very difficult uh, league to project. You know, you can see one of any eight of, of six or seven teams winning this league. Obviously Michigan state's off to a tremendous start taking Gonzaga to the wire on an aircraft carrier and then beating Kentucky in double overtime last night. Um, I did not expect Michigan state to have that kind of ability, uh, two elite teams hung with both of them. 
Uh, you look at uh, Michigan, who brings back Hunter Dickinson and some really intriguing transfers from the Ivy League. Um, we'll see how they do in, the, in this coming tournament that they're starting um, uh, as we speak on a Wednesday this week. Um, you have Purdue with Zach Eady, uh, able to beat Marquette last night in, that, in kind of their first big test. Illinois brought in Terrence Shannon, you know, one of the best Big 12 scorers, and Matthew Mayer, who everybody knows is the, the mullet man from Baylor. Um, Illinois has had a great program here for a couple of years now. They're certainly a contender, and I think a lot of people are sleeping on Iowa. Um, Iowa is a team with Chris Murray back and a, and a really a starting five still that's got a lot of experience. I think they've got one of the best offenses in the country, um, which means they can go out and outscore you on any given day. Um, Iowa is a team to be taken seriously. And last but not least, but Wisconsin's actually off to a pretty good start uh, playing suffocating defense and uh, a, a nice win over Stanford early on. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at them as well. Yeah, there's a lot of, I guess, uncertainty about the league coming into the season, but just a little bit over a week in, into the year, there's been some, as you mentioned, some really positive developments. And it kind of makes me wonder if the league ultimately may end up a little bit stronger uh, than many of us thought in the preseason. That'll obviously play out here over the next couple of weeks and when we get into Big Ten play. But I think it's always a good thing for the league as many non-conference games that you can win against uh, good competition. And Michigan State beating Kentucky last night, I think, is just a favorable development overall uh, for the Big Ten. Let's get into Friday's game at Xavier. Uh, it's the... It's the marquee matchup, I guess you could say, of the Gavit tip-off games uh, this season. Uh, 6 p.m. tip uh, Friday night uh, from the CentOS Center in Cincinnati, someplace I've never actually been for a game. You, you've been there multiple times. What's just the general atmosphere like uh, at the CentOS Center for, for a basketball game? I've, I've watched on TV before. It seems like uh, a little bit of a smaller arena, but, but they, they do seem to draw pretty well and, and seem to have a, a pretty good environment there uh, to support the Musketeers. Yeah, they do. They support them very well. I think season tickets. Um, I'm guessing. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's a wait list to get to get in there on a season ticket uh, basis. Uh, but it, it's. Uh, I've been there. I think three times, for, and each time was a different Big East game. I think I saw them play Marquette, Providence, and Butler on different uh, seasons. But it was during some of those good years when they had Paul Scrubs, Quentin Good, good in, and um, Tyreek Jones, Najee Marshall, a bunch of those guys, and. Um, competing for uh, spots in the, in the NCAAs and, and, and uh, some big time games, which is why I went there. But um, in general, it's a rowdy atmosphere. It's a very intimate setting. Um, you know, it's not a very big building. And when you're in there, the noise is pretty trapped in. So um, they did a great job designing it. It's, uh, it's still relatively new. I think the first time I went might have been the first year after they did the remodel there. Um, and I'm just blown away. It's one of the nicest places I've, I've seen in, in the country. Um, and so the always looked forward to going back, uh, the next couple of times I went afterwards. Um, it's also just a great area of Cincinnati. I think it's probably the nicest area. Um, it's a beautiful private campus, uh, a lot of, a lot of good places to eat right nearby, a lot of good places to go, go out after the game on a Friday. So for any Hoosiers listening to this, um, yeah, soak up the experience. It's a lot of, it, it'll be a lot of fun out there. So this savior team, a lot of times you see a coaching change and it's a, it could be a, a major rebuilding effort. We're seeing that right now with Louisville. That's zero and three and uh, has really struggled here early in the season. This savior team, I believe won the NIT last season. Correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, they brought back some significant pieces from last year and, the, and they add a coach in Sean Miller, who's very familiar with the program. You know, he obviously spent a lot of time there before Moving on to Arizona, now back at the helm uh, in Cincinnati, and looking at their early results, uh, I believe they're three and zero so far. Dealing with, obviously with an with an injury right now to one of their top players, but just overall entering the season, what what were your what was your outlook for Xavier as a team, and what you know is this a is this an NCAA tournament team entering the season in your eyes? Yeah, it, it's an interesting one because you, anytime you can return a core like uh, Jack Nungy. Uh, Zach Fremantle, Colby Jones, who's the, you know, the player in question for Friday in terms of his status, uh, missing the game on Tuesday against Fairfield. Um, you know, I know so Sule Boom, their point guard, I've followed for a number of years. He actually started his career out here in the West Coast at San Francisco. 
Um, and he's played very, very well at like the conference USA and WCC levels. I'm very curious to see how he does in a, you know, in a power six league, like the big East. Um, so this will be a huge test Friday for, for him, for our first taste of that, um, running the show and Kai Kai Tandy will, will help him out there. Another senior, uh, it's an old team, Adam Kunkel's, you know, their, their lead shooting guard that on the injury side is the good news. Kunkel was banged up. Uh, for the last few weeks. And it looks like after getting 30 plus minutes last night, um, he's good to go. Uh, and, and I think that's a, that's a big boost for them. Um, so, you know, we'll have to see the status on, on Colby Jones, but, but overall as a whole, you know, with the coaching change, I, I think you just look at the talent as a whole. Um, they're certainly measure out as an NCAA tournament forecasted team coming into the year. Uh, however, you know, anytime there's a coaching change, some Im- unpredictability, uh, I could easily see, uh, and the, just the competitiveness of the Big East. I think there's about seven, eight, maybe even nine Big East teams fighting for perhaps five or six spots. Um, so the the games will be won on the margins. Um, there's no dominant Villanova in the Big East this year either. So Xavier's ceiling could be as, as high as winning the Big East, um, but their bottom could be as low as eighth or ninth because it's just – so even from from one to nine or at this point, uh, from a forecasting standpoint, I, I went ahead and put them in, um, I think, 39th to start the year. This morning, the 36 with a couple of teams dropping. Um, so they're right in that 35 to 40 range, which would make them safe to get in still. Uh, but again, uh, the, the, once league play starts in, in this league and in the Big Ten, uh, I mean, you got to win games on the margins, which comes down to, you know, how you handle crunch time. Uh, how you handle your rotations, all those little decisions become uh, put under the magnifying glass between, you know, who's going to get in the NCAA and who's going to go to the NIT. You mentioned this earlier, but this is exactly the kind of team that India could not beat on the road last season. I think, you know, they, they did have three big 10 uh, road wins and they all came against teams that, that didn't ultimately make the NCAA tournament. I believe they beat Minnesota, they beat Maryland and they beat Nebraska. Uh, right. any, any road, any road win is a good win in the big 10, but you know, if, if you're going to be mentioned in the light of, uh, or, or in the category of, of contender in the league, the expectation is you're going to go better than 500, at least in, in the league, uh, on the road, uh, in most circumstances, how does Indiana match up with the Xavier team? What, what do you see as, as kind of the, the areas that they may be able to exploit and, and any particular area that, Xavier excels in that, that may give Indiana some problems. You know, one thing I, that comes to mind immediately, just from an, from an intrigue standpoint is the matchup in the front court, because Fremantle yeah. and, and Nunji could both step out and shoot the three uh, a little bit. Uh, Nunji, obviously a little bit better than Fremantle who had a triple double, by the way, uh, against Fairfield. Yeah. So he's a uh, really uh, well-rounded player. Uh, the, the matchup with those two against the Indiana front court of, of Trace Jackson Davis, race Thompson and uh, Malik Renault is, uh, very intriguing to me, at least on paper. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, same, same here. And I, I would just start with, the, you know, the Nunji Fremantle combo. Uh, you know, if you go back to to last year, and uh, a lot of the concerns coming into the year is they got to be on the court quite a bit because they they provide so much offense to Xavier's attack, uh, but they give up quite a bit defensively. Uh, their defensive numbers don't grade out well analytically. And when you're going up against TG, <laughs> TJD and Ray Thompson and Malik and and the Indiana front court, that's a that's a big advantage I think for the Hoosiers. Um, you know, and and I do think when Xavier has the ball, uh, Indiana I like their defense a lot last year. So far, the metrics are in love with Indiana's defense. Obviously, they've only played two teams that they were in a different weight class than uh, with Moorhead State and Bethune Cookman. But uh, right now, Indiana's defense is uh, adjusted defense at number eight in the nation. Um, I, I do think Indiana's defense is quite a bit better than Xavier's. Um, I, I think that's where they can really frustrate Xavier. Now, um, since this game is at Cintas, uh, I, I believe the game flow will <clears throat> dictate if that's going to happen or not. Uh, if Xavier can get off to a good start, that changes everything. Um, the most interesting thing uh, when it comes to the good starts is uh, Xavier, even in their exhibition game, uh, in all three games in the regular season thus far, they've gotten off to really slow starts. Uh, in the first 10 minutes, I think they've been either trailing or just got down in a hole to start each game. And I don't, I don't know if they can afford to do that here. Um, obviously, uh, 40 minutes is a lot longer than, the first eight or 10. Uh, but, but I do think um, 
you know, they'll want to make sure they figure out a way to fix that going into this matchup specifically, especially with those, you know, I I think on the defensive side of the ball, Indiana's has got such a better D, uh, especially in the front court. The other element of the game I wanted to bring up is, you know, coming into the season for Indiana, uh, I think a lot of the concerns were around shooting and spacing. uh, And we'll, even though the first two games of the year for the Hoosiers were great signs, I, I believe this will really kind of show where they're at. Um, because I do think Xavier's perimeter defense is a little bit better than uh, the interior. Um, and, sh- and so can you know Miller Cop stay hot? Uh, do those looks get created that they've been able to create in the first couple games? Um, a lot of mysteries when it comes to that that we'll start to get a sense of uh, it, with some real true high-level competition. And I, I th- I'd say when Xavier has the ball, you know, for who's your fans to be aware of, N- Nunji and Fremantle are not just great scorers, but they're unbelievable passers as well. And one thing that that has really shown itself here in the first few games is that they've been really good doing the two man game together, um, which is really kind of fascinating for two big men to uh, play the two man game together with with guards kind of as the decoy. Um, so I'm kind of curious to see how much that continues. Uh, and so I, those are the main things on paper from a matchup standpoint that I'm looking uh, looking forward to seeing. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. That's one thing Mike Woodson really likes. I think about Race Thompson and Trace Jackson Davis. He he last year got in. He, he called it buddy ball. He said yeah. he, he believes that those guys kind of play very well off of each other. And I think that's one thing that they do. Uh, you know, you know, Race will get the ball maybe in in the high post at times and look for Trace on a on an easy dump down. And I think both of those guys do a, a pretty good job of playing off of each other. So I, I, I'm really fascinated just to see how this matchup goes. Nunji's obviously somebody that's familiar with Indiana from his time in yep. the big 10 at Iowa. I believe he's probably played against Trace Jackson Davis uh, in the past. So I have some familiarity there. One thing, just looking at Xavier here early in the season, looking at their Ken Palm profile, I know we can't really draw too many conclusions early in the season. It's only been three games, but to me, it looks like they're playing a little bit faster than Sean Miller team typically does. Is that just indicative of the the competition that they've played early in the season, or is there something to that maybe to where this game will be played at a little bit faster tempo than 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 a typical Xavier or Sean Miller team? Yeah, I think he's doing that to fit his personnel. That's just my two cents on it. Uh, I you know Sule Boom's a guy that loves to run and gun. Uh, he did that at UTEP. He did that at San Francisco. Uh, and if he's running the point uh, specifically, because uh, I know his game very well, um, I, you know, Sean Miller is smart enough to understand uh, that, you know, tempo is, should be based on or, or desired tempo uh, should be based on your personnel. Um, so he's got two, you know, if you can create more possessions with a with a group of scorers like Nunji and Fremantle and Boom and Kunkel, um, you're probably going to do yourself pretty well with a roster like this. So to me, that's what it is. You know, in, in, in their opener, they got up to 81 possessions. Uh, they yeah. had 70, 74 last night. You can tell that Montana in the, in the second game tried to take that away, uh, but they still got, you know, uh, beat really badly, 22 points there. So, and the other thing about this matchup is Xavier, um, it, it, not that it's a huge difference, but playing Montana and Fairfield is a little bit stronger than, the opponents that uh, Indiana's played. So yeah. perhaps from that little standpoint, they're a tad bit more prepared uh, for some formidable competition. But yeah, besides that, like that, that's just what I would draw from the outside looking in. They've also shot the ball really well. I mean, it's, it's early, but Indiana's, you mentioned they're, they're hot shooting to start the season. I think they're at 40% on threes. It's only two games. We don't know if that'll continue. We obviously probably figure that they're not going to shoot. 40% for the season on threes, but Xavier's all the way up at 45 and a half percent, which is good for 17 in the country. They're not taking a high volume, but I, you know, if they can hit some timely threes, I think that that really helps them out. And in particular, Nunji, looking at his, his shooting, uh, five of eight from distance, all right, of the season, he's also making 65% of his twos. He struggled a little bit from the free throw line, but Xavier to me is a difficult matchup not only because uh, of how well they seem to be playing early in the season in terms of just understanding uh, what, what what they want to do and, and kind of embracing what, what Sean Miller wants them to do as a coach, but they're, they're an experienced team. You look up and down their roster, they're playing a lot of guys who are juniors and seniors, and that's 
er, early in a season, uh, you know, Indiana obviously has a lot of continuity w- with its roster, but going on the road for the first time is always tough. And I think it's even tougher when you go up against a team with a lot of upper class experience like Xavier has. Exactly. And I, and I think part of the, the, the strategy, at least early on for Xavier in these first three games is uh, beyond just creating the extra possessions uh, with, with better tempo uh, is the, the attacking the basket. I mean, they've gotten to the line uh, with regularity. Um, they've got some really high foul rates for a few of their players of, of getting to the line. Now, obviously the sample size is so small. You can't take a ton from that. And obviously the competition is not, uh, hasn't been the, what they'll play most of the year, but, but I think that's a point of emphasis. Um, you know, they've, they've played three games, so you can draw a lot from that, but any kind of percentage, you know, Nunji's a 70 plus percent free throw shooter for his career. Uh, Fremantle's more than the like high sixties. Uh, but <clears throat> anyway, they're, I think they're going to try to do what they do against Indiana and just kind of see how they stack up and then they'll have to make adjustments from there. Um, and then Indiana, might have might be doing some of the same so i think it's it's more it, it's more of a boxing match type of game because it's really the first game of the year in a lot of ways for both teams the first meaningful game and um the, you know the, te- the both coaching staffs are going to learn a lot about how their players respond in these situations um you know indiana might have an edge there because like we talked about before it is a lot of the same guys whereas xavier's got a whole new staff um trying to figure out the best ways to use their pieces um, so that does give Indiana a, a slight edge from the, from the boxing match analogy, but, but otherwise, yeah, it's, it's, it'll be fascinating because I, I feel like things are working so well for both teams early on. There's no reason for them to try to, uh, tweak things for the opponent. Um, and, unless it's Xavier trying to adjust defensively somehow, uh, to match up with Indiana's weapons. How important is Colby Jones to, uh, what Xavier does and how, big of an impact does having him or not having him have on Friday's uh, outcome? Well, I mean, he's a, if you go back to last year, he was a huge part of Xavier's recipe. Not, not saying that Xavier had a great year. They they obviously went to the NIT and won it, but um, you know, he was sixth in the big East in minute share. Uh, He played basically 85% of their minutes in, in big East play Uh, pretty much a glue to the, to the entire lineup. Uh, and so, yeah, he, he's a, he's a critical piece for, uh, what, what they're, what they do. And if you look throughout his career, um, you know, he met, he missed the game against Virginia tech last year and they won by one point. So it's hard to really know how big of an impact he made. Uh, but, but it's very rare. He misses, misses time. Uh, that's the only game he missed last season. And I, and I just think he does so many things well in terms of both the offensive and defensive side of the ball. Um, he's, he's had about, so all of last year he had a 110, uh, almost 111 offensive rating. If people aren't familiar with the analytics, you know, anything north of 100 is good. Anything north of 110 is excellent. Um, and and so, and he started off the first couple of games with a 127 rating. Uh, so he's he's a very, very efficient player. Um, plus minus stats, O rating stats, uh, defensive rate. Um, he, he, he does things like pick up, picks up blocks even as a six, six guy um, at, at a 5.4% rate early on this year. So there's, there's a lot to love about his game and, and he's clearly a critical piece. So um, if you're Xavier, you don't want to be missing somebody like that for, for a big time opponent like Indiana. One thing that we can't predict by looking at stats or, or uh, preseason rosters or anything going into this game is, just how motivated Sean Miller is going to be coaching against Indiana, the school that obviously uh, fired Archie Miller after four seasons. Not that it was an unjust firing or anything like that. He had his opportunity to get things done in Bloomington. Didn't get the job done. They moved on. But I can remember back to last season on the field of 68. I think there was an exchange at one point where, you know, Sean had some choice words, uh, you know, for Indiana fans, just talking uh, about how, uh, you know, they're, uh, I, I guess, unrealistic expectations archie obviously didn't have anything to say he wasn't going to take the bait on that but sean i guess playing the part of the big brother and was going to stand up for his brother which you understand but do you think there's any added motivation for sean miller going into to friday night to to stick it to indiana and beat him i'm glad you mentioned that yeah i got to do a little work with both those guys on field of 68 last year and uh i would i would be willing to bet 
a lot that he's a hundred percent going to use that <laughs> uh, for his own reasons. I don't know if he'll carry yeah. over to the players, uh, but he will be fired up. Uh, he really only knows one speed regardless. Um, and so if you give him just a little extra incentive like that, he'll, he'll take it and run with it. That's just how he's wired and, and built. You know, we watched him out here in the pack 12 for several years. And um, you know, those last couple of years were strange because he was up against the FBI stuff every, every press conference. But uh, now that he's kind of back and trying to reestablish himself, he had a great run at Xavier before he's going to use every piece of ammunition. I think I th- you can tell just from, the relationship they had doing that show last year together, uh, how close they really are and yeah. how much they care for each other. Um, that, that it certainly is going to matter to them. There's no question about it. So who do you like in this game Friday? Great question. Um, I, I think, Andy, I think Indiana wins a, a tight one. Um, you know, I think if Indiana were actually playing at home, I would pick them to win by double digits and run away from Xavier just because I think they could exploit it and get the crowd behind them and run away. I think in this game, You'll probably see some ebbs and flows. If Xavier sticks with their trend of starting slow, Indiana could actually get a lead early. Uh, but, of course, Xavier will come back and punch at some point, probably make it tight second half. But I think Indiana will have enough horses in depth because especially without Colby Jones, Indiana certainly has the depth advantage um, to, to get it done. Uh, and I think, you know, I think, I think just in general, if this was on a neutral court, I have Indiana a couple of tiers stronger than Xavier, just based on all the factors we've laid out on the show. Um, and I think that matters a lot earlier in the year. Uh, so, so I will go with Indiana in a narrow victory. Rocco, I wanted to also ask you, you're a West Coast guy, obviously cover college basketball everywhere, but you, you know a lot about the West Coast and the Pac-12. Just what, what's your reaction overall? I, I know it's been uh, since the summer uh, when this news came out, but of UCLA and USC coming to the Big Ten in a couple of years, what's what was kind of your uh, your reaction to that, and, and how does it, you know, maybe impact the Pac-12 going forward from a basketball perspective, and, and also uh, the Big Ten just in general? I guess how weird is it going to be to have uh, Big Ten games out on the West Coast? Yeah, I mean, it, it was a punch to the gut, and, and personally, you know, I'm a uh, originally from Seattle. I've lived in California for um, over a decade now, but uh, West West Coast has been home like my entire life, and um, it just it's just hard to imagine. Especially, if, you know, I'll start with football because this is a football driven move. Um, right. It's hard to imagine, you know, a Pac-10 or a Pac-12, Pac anything without the LA schools. Um, it's a uh, uh, you know, USC and Washington have had the most success in the history of the league. And, you know, Oregon over the last 25 years has been strong. And UCLA is just right there with Stanford as being dominant in basically every Olympic sport you can ever think of. Um, they're basically the top two in the nation every year. Uh, and so it's just kind of crazy from a all sports standpoint that this move is across the board. If there were, if there was a way to make it football only, I think everybody could live with it and be, um, and be okay with it, but to have UCLA volleyball fly into East Lansing on a Tuesday night is just kind of silly. Um, and, and and even volleyball is a popular sport. I mean, we can go even further with with smaller sports, but but in general, yeah, that's the initial reaction I had. Um, it's been a lot to process, but we get it from a you know from the business side of sports. I totally understand. Uh, you know, especially for USC, why they need to do it or why they want to do it. Um, and you know, it's just a spending problem. Um, you know, at, at the power five level schools, bring in all kinds of money from the, from the television revenue, uh, pac 12 obviously fell way behind the big 10 and the sec. Uh, and, and, uh, so the spending got out of control and now, uh, to continue that spending and to continue recruiting at the same level as the big 10 and sec, they just felt like that was the best move for them. Um, so we understand that, but, uh, what I think the future holds here is, you know, it's uh, from what Rick Neuheisel said, just, you know, a couple months back, I, I tend to trust him. He's, he's always steered us right as a former Washington football coach. Uh, sounds like Washington, Oregon will get invited. So if that does happen, I mean, the future of the PAC 12 is going to be totally different. Um, you know, I don't know what that means for Stanford or Cal, uh, or Notre Dame. Um, obviously we're all standing by to see what happens with, with all of those schools. Um, but I think the no brainer is to, to get a Southern California team, at least in the mix. So that would probably include San Diego state. Um, some of the other people I've talked to think it includes SMU. 
uh, so they can get the Dallas market, which is a very interesting kind of not traditional Pac-12 fit, uh, just because they are uh, a private school uh, that that is you know not like a Stanford or a or a USC, um, a little bit different of a of being a Methodist school. Um, so we'll see. Those seem to be the two favorites to join. Uh, Gonzaga's Gonzaga is the one I think they've got to get. You know, if all let's just imagine this all goes through. Um, because if you're Gonzaga, you're getting courted by the Big 12, uh, the Big East, and and the Pac-12. Let's just assume. Um, if I'm Gonzaga, I think the key is they got they're they're a school that's dominated their league for 25 years. They've been to 25 consecutive WCC title games, and most of those years they've been nationally ranked, if not nationally dominant. Uh, in order to maintain that level of dominance, they need to come to a league where there's really only two other powers, which would be Arizona and UCLA on most given years, especially lately. Uh, then they're right in the mix, and then it becomes the, th- the three-pack. Uh, UCLA eventually leaves, then it could just be them in Arizona, right? So <clears throat> from Gonzaga, if I'm a Gonzaga fan, that's what I'm rooting for. If they go to the Big 12, uh, as a great example, or even the Big East, you could easily see them slipping down to the middle of the pack pretty quickly, and that will affect a lot of their uh, strategic relationships. Uh, if you look at how Gonzaga got Chet Holmgren, or, or Suggs, or a lot of these recent pickups they've had in the past few classes, it's because of their connections to USA basketball. It's their connections to Nike. And I think some of that starts to go away if they go to a league like the Big 12 or the Big East, where two, one or two middle of the pack seasons, all of a sudden they're not Gonzaga anymore. They're, you know, look at Wichita State as a, as a kind of a, not, not the same example, but a similar example. They go up to the American Conference. They don't finish first for a couple of years. You know, it started okay the first first few years, and then recently now they've slipped to the middle of the pack, and now they're just kind of stuck in the mud in the American. Um, so if I'm a Gonzaga fan, like I, I'm not rooting for that, and I think the Pac-12 is the logical choice. Um, but anyway, those are just my general thoughts to start. I have a million more, <laughs> but I won't bore you. Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, it, it, it's a stunning development. It's going to be really tough to get used to, especially on the football side of things. I'm not going to get used to any 10 p.m. Big Ten tip offs Eastern time, you know, I'm exactly. in the Eastern time zone. That that's going to be uh, brutal uh, to watch it, and also, you know, from a media it perspective, it, it kind of creates a a bit of a nightmare because uh, you know, is 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 the is USC and UCLA media going to travel to to Rutgers to cover games and vice versa? You know, it, it becomes a lot. But obviously, we we all know this is football and money driven, so that's what what rules the world, and and none of us uh, in this conversation are naive to that, but for selfish reasons, you know, you, you would like to see kind of some of the traditions of college sports preserved. That's not going to happen. Rocco, you're on Twitter at, at Rocco Miller eight. And I will say this, uh, Rocco is a great follow during the off season. He follows scheduling, non-conference scheduling as closely as anybody. Um, you can, the great thing about his Twitter account is you can find a little bit of everything. He's, you know, he's, covering low major mid major schools he's also you know has some information out there about you know the, the top programs in college basketball you you cover it all that's why you were the first person i thought of when i i, I knew i needed to have somebody uh come on to to talk about xavier so what where beyond twitter where else uh can folks find your your work and, and are you are you going to be doing anything again this season with field of 68 or was that just a one-year deal yeah, appreciate all the kind words, uh, Alex. That really, really means a lot. Um, I would just say, uh, Rocco Miller Eight Twitter account is going to direct you and all things I got going on. There's a million little things I show up on <laughs> throughout the yeah. year. Uh, um, I, yeah, so I've been doing some work with Field of Sixty Eight already this year. I was on the uh, season preview for the mid major show. So if you have any interest in mid major, go ahead and check that out. It's on it's on their YouTube feed from last week. Um, I think as we get into January, February, March, uh, hopefully Andy and I will be back on um, their bracketology show like we did last year. Um, if that's the case, it'll be Mondays and Fridays again. And um, if not, we'll have plenty of other things. I, I'm, I'm fully expecting that we'll bring that back. And I'm, I'm talking to those guys behind the scenes, too, about a bunch of other creative ideas, which is why paying attention to the Twitter will, will be the best source. But on bracketu.org, my website, uh, throughout November and December, uh, starting next week, we'll honor, uh, we, we do a fun article every week that basically looks at all 32 conferences across college basketball, give out some teams of the week award, but it's really to just call attention to a lot of, 
untold stories in the sport. And, and if you're a power school and you had a great week, we're going to recognize you as well. Uh, so hopefully for Hoosier fans, we'll get Indiana in there one of these weeks after a couple big wins. And then uh, when we get to January through March this year, um, I'll bracket updates will be done uh, based on the entire criteria of the selection committee. So uh, opinions will be removed by January. I promise that. And uh, we'll be using just data and uh, psychology and art and science to build those brackets. So i uh, try to make those as interesting and educational as I can. And I um, appreciate everybody for following along over the years. Thank you, Rocco, uh, for coming on. I really appreciate your time. Podcast on the Brink listeners, we will be back at some point next week. It's Thanksgiving week. Try to squeeze in an episode, though, uh, talking about what happens on Friday night at the CentOS Center. It could be obviously a big win for Indiana. It could also be more of the same from last season, a road loss. So you have to tune in Friday night and, and find out. But we'll, we will be back, like I said, next week at some point. If you, if you do enjoy the show, uh, please... Just take a couple of minutes and leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It helps more people uh, recognize and, and find our work. We really appreciate that. And, and thanks, everybody, list, for listening this week. Thanks again for Rocco, uh, to Rocco for coming on. And we'll talk to everybody again soon on another episode of Podcast on the Brink.